Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this instalment of Desert Island Art. Uh, this evening I've got with me the lovely Dr. Philip Tonner, a lecturer in education from the School of Education at University of Glasgow. Good evening. Good evening Sandy, thank you for having me on. Uh, thank you very much for agreeing to speak with me. Um, it's an unusual setup for me because, uh, not to start with a negative, but you're not an artist. Um, and so you're the right. first person I'm speaking to about their appreci uh, appreciation of art and artifact who doesn't necessarily make artwork themselves. Yeah, absolutely right. I, I have no, uh, I, the last time I attempted to make anything resembling a piece of art was in standard grade art at school um, when I drew a, I drew a duck, a still life duck for my, for my standard grade exam. And that was the, that was the, that was the last attempt. I found myself much more happy when it came to trying to write about art. Um, so I enjoyed writing an essay at that time about um, Charles Ray Macintosh and architecture, mm. but I found the, the actual creation of art very, very challenging, so I decided to give that up. Is there any element of you finding it so challenging that then encouraged you to study it in a different way? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think I realised how important it was um, on, a, on a level that I couldn't articulate at the time. So the very idea of composition was something that, that, that made me really, you know, really think about what it is we do when we, when we try to, well, when we do produce art, when people produce art and what, what, the, what it means to compose. And I think that's something that actually, you know, goes across the arts, not just, not just visual art and, and non-representational art, because it has a compositional element too, but, you know, the written art, you know, in, in poetry or in, in, uh, in various other forms of writing and also in music, so we can maybe talk a little bit about the idea of composition as we as we get into these works. Okay, so um, when I invited you, first of all, to do this with me this evening, it very much is about, you know, what would you want to have with you uh, to sustain you through the, the long days on your desert island? Um, and so the things you've chosen, they're, they're also quite unusual. Uh, and we'll see as we go through the slides and um, the five pieces you've selected. I don't even know if I can call them pieces. Certainly I can call the first. Uh, image, a piece of art, um, and yeah, it's obvious we can see there on the screen Vincent van Gogh shoes, 1886. Why did you choose to take this with you to your desert? Yeah. It's a good question. I think that one of the things that I started to think about when you asked me to to do this and to think about it is that what, in, in a you know, not just what an individual piece means, but what my engagement with art has meant to me um, and I thought that one of the things that I would find well, I would find important to sustain me if I were on this desert island would be to connect it to some of uh, some of the intellectual work that I've tried to do over the last 15 years or so mm -hmm. um, so in a sense some of these works are about for me they're about remembering not on, you know, on a, on, a, on, a, on a viewer's perspective. So they're not only about the work itself, but they're, in a sense, it's, it, for me, it's also about what the work's doing for me as a viewer. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's one of the things that, you know, I, I have, will talk about as we go through these, is that the, I approached all of these works of art, all of these contexts of art, um, because of my early study of the philosopher Martin Heidegger. Um, Martin Heidegger wrote a famous uh, essay on the origin of the work of art, and in that he talks about the the, the the pair of shoes, as he puts it, from from Van Gogh. Now, of course, the the first thing you notice when you look at this is, is there are two shoes, but to me, it always it almost looks a little bit like they're two left shoes. Mm. Um, so the first question you might ask, and indeed has been asked by by someone who took Heidegger to task, is well, how do you know they're a pair of shoes? How do you know they're a pair? But what Heidegger argued in this uh, essay was that they, in fact, were a pair. They were a pair of shoes owned by a peasant woman. And they were, he took them to be the kind of shoes, hobnail boots, that, that, that the peasants around um, his part of Germany in the Black Forest would have been wearing. And he puts it this way. He says that the, the, the work of art reveals the world of the peasant woman. So what does he mean by that? Well, a world isn't, for Heidegger, it's not just a matter of um, an abstract representation. 
a, an object or, a, or, a, or an image that we hold up to ourselves and you know, an idea about a kind of world picture or something like that. What he's interested in is, is, the, is the, the inhabited world, the world in which human beings dwell, if I can put it that way. Mm-hmm. And what he suggests is that when you look at this, you look at the worn in shoes, um, you get a sense of the kind of world, the kind of worldly concerns, the kind of activities, the kinds of sensitivities that the person who would have worn those shoes had. So you get, uh, if you like, a, a, a poetic sense of the world as inhabited by the owner of those shoes. Um, as one of Heidegger's um, successors in, in this tradition of thought would have put it, you get something of a fusion of horizons with the, the person, um, in this case, um, the, the creator of the work of art, but also indeed the person who would have worn the shoes, you get the sense of a, of a, of a bringing together of how you might see the world, how they might see the world. And in that, you know, in that experience, in that event, you get a new set of meanings being created, a new way of thinking um, that is then, uh, you know, developed in, in, in your own interpretations as you move forward in your life. Yeah, I've always found it interesting that where we have the intersection between the artist and the, the object or the, the subject, that there's also then the intersecting part of the audience um, and that then the audience sees everything through their own prism. And so yeah. art is never fixed. What do you think? I completely agree. I mean, I think that's exactly it. I mean, again, it's the, the idea is that audiences are brought about in the same way that artists are brought about through a, through a social practice, through something that we do. Mm. And of course, we think of art as a, a you know, a, sub, a subject, a, a broadly subjective enterprise in that, you know, a, a, an individual artist creates something uh, um, that they imagine or that the, you know, an object in some way, maybe in a gallery or something like that, but it's in some sense consumed by consumers, by, by, by viewers of art, you know, by, by critics and by interested people who enjoy the, the, the subjective experience of looking at art. Mm. Um, in a sense, that sort of, that's a bit of an afterthought for someone like Heidegger. He thinks that really what's going on actually is that art is, is when, when, we, when we start to think about art, in those sort of subjectivist consumerist terms, we sort of miss the point about what's really going on in, in as he would put it, great works of art, like the like Van Gogh's pair of shoes and some of the other things we're going to look at. Um, what he thinks is actually there's the, the the art itself, this this practice that is is the origin of of the individual work of the artist and of the audience, or as he puts it, uh, uh, creators, um, artists he calls them creators, and he calls audiences uh, preservers because they have to preserve what the work of art and the artist have, have brought into being and have, have set into a figure in some way. So for Heidegger, well, what have they done? They've, they've, set into, they've set into some kind of figure, um, an event of truth, a revelation of the truth of the world inhabited by that particular individual, in this case, the peasant woman, if indeed you know, he's right about this. Um, and that's, that's, you know, the... the when we think on our more reflective moments, um, when we catch ourselves aware, let's say you're out for a walk or something like that, and, or you're just, um, you know, perhaps you're sitting sitting on the shore of, a, of, of the beach and you're, you're watching the tide or something like that, and you get this, this kind of poetic sense of, um, you, you, you know, you're, you're at homeness or you're, you know, you're, um, you're, being in the being being I, I don't want to say at one with things that's not really what I mean but what I mean is a kind of um, sense of oneself as an inhabitant of the world not just as some as a as a someone who might sit back and represent it but as a as a as an as an agent who is able to inhabit and negotiate and has a sense of knowing of things that's in a sense pre pre reflective. You know, it's not it's not a case of sitting there thinking I can analyze the the you know the chemical composition of the sand. I can go and ma- measure wave functions uh, or what have you. You know, looking at the water and I can set up experiments and cameras and do all that kind of thing. Now, of course, we can. But what I'm getting at here is that there's a a sense in which there is a, a kind of know how 
that we have that's individual to us, but also developed through our having been born in a particular time and place, having the families we have and the the people, um, the cultural outlooks that we have that have developed up around us. We, 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 we inhabit that. We inhabit the world. So when Heidegger's saying that artworks bring forth the world of, of the peasant woman, that's what he's trying to get at. I mean, I mean, I may not put that very well, but what I'm trying to say is that it brings home that it brings home the homely character of their world, their homeliness about things. Now that can be that can be seen to be somewhat problematic um, on a few levels, but one would be that it um, it perhaps ignores certain political uh, issues, perhaps it, you know um, issues of exploitation or, or or what have you in terms of the the life of the peasant and, and so on. But um, I think he's, he is he is I think getting at something quite important that um, art is not just about subjective representation. It's more I feel like it's more truthful than that. It's more um, it has a it has a job to do. It has a particular form of work. You know. I'm going to just <laughs> this uh, Paleolithic cave painting it's from the series of works at Lascaux. Why did you choose this? I mean apart from anything we may have some problems getting this to your de your desert island. I don't know how we transplant a cave. Why did <laughs> That's you a good point. That's a very good point. I mean you know that I would recommend maybe buying a little um, picture book of Paleolithic art. No, the, the archaeologist Paul Ban has a, has a, a guide book to the, the cave sites of, of Europe great little book and he's done lots of other stuff that's well worth checking out um, the reason I chose this um, is sticking with the theme of Heidegger um, Heidegger argued that there wasn't a prehistory of art okay and the reason he suggested that was because he thought that artworks bring a, a, a people into history they bring them into a, a, a form of, of history and um, that he was interested in and that history for him is, and again, we can perhaps explore this a little bit, is what he called a, a history of being. Uh, and that is something that he saw as occurring really with a Greek origin. So he didn't think there was a, a prehistory to, to art in that sense. Now, what he means by a history of being, of course, is open to, to different different interpretations. But the one I'll put forward is that, that it's... It's, it's a history of the way in which things can be meaningfully there for you, right, or for a community. Mm. So that, you know, you, you are a member of a community and individual as you are, you share, a, you share an outlook with others. And that, uh, that outlook is, in an important sense, made possible by the kinds of works of art that we have around us. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the other objects here as we go along, but the, 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 the Paleolithic art specifically, um, I, I, well, I, one of the reasons I chose it is because I, I, find, I find it fascinating. I find it absolutely amazing. I was a, about maybe, I think I was, I think I was 19 when I saw my first up close Paleolithic art. I was in France and I went to the Cave New. Uh, and it's a remarkable place. You can park, you can park um, cars and buses and things like that in the entrance to this cave. It's huge. Um, and you go down into this cave and it takes maybe about 15 minutes or something like that to get to where the art is. Um, and it's uh, similar to this. It's similar to the dark, uh, almost charcoal looking um, figures at the bottom there on the walls. This is you know, parietal art, you know, art on walls and, 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 and ceilings. Um, and it's it's a truly remarkable experience. You know, you're you're in you're in France and it was in summer, so it's quite warm outside. Um, and as you go into the cave, it gets colder and it's moist and it's wet and it's it's very unhomely. It's not a place that you'd want to stay. It's not a place that you'd want to live. It's not a place that you'd want to set up a camp or anything like that. Um, and then you see the art. You know, now some of the art that's 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 in this. Um, but just let's just call it Paleolithic cave art. Some of the Paleolithic cave art um, is actually has actually been produced in caves that were not intended to. Well, we 
I would suggest are not intended for, uh, you know, a, 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 a general viewing by by members of of a group. They're um, they look as if they've been put put on the walls by paralytic um, uh, uh, I was going to say the opposite of mountaineers, uh, speleologist. Mm -hmm. I forget. It's just gone out of my mind. Um, someone who explores the cave, you know, and goes in into the little tight cracks and goes all the way through it. And they found art in there that's been produced in these places. And the suggestion is that actually maybe some of this art really wasn't intended to be seen. Can in I that just sense. Stop there. Perhaps it's it's yeah, yeah, go on. Much more about your uh, your your raw experience of of participating in the viewing of these things. So you're in a very privileged position, as am I, in that, that art has been made available to you because of choices that you've had, because of the education yeah. that you've chosen. Absolutely. And your personal interest. Uh, when you were with this or work like it, you've traveled through almost like a struggled journey of going through this very inhospitable seeming uh, interior space. And to emerge in, into a, essentially a room in which there is something ancient and going back to the, the notion of truthful. Is there an element of, of com commune, communing between you and the art? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that um, I think that's right. I think you, what, what you're it's, it's close to a religious experience. Mm. Um, if I can put it like that, when you when you go in and see these things, they are so ancient. Um, is, it you know, a, is it a kind of you know almost holy because it's ancient, or for some other reason? Is there something deep within the the well source of our own uh, spirituality, for example, that allows us to to form relationships with with something other that we can't define or even? Uh, yeah, I think that's I think that's a really a really important point. I mean, one of the things that you know just to just to bring in. Uh, Heidegger here is the sort of thread that's running through this as he says that what art does like this is put up put up for decision the holy right it puts up for decision what's going to count as the ultimate values of a community the ultimate values of a group mm -hmm. and it's precisely for that reason that that you know I've, I've suggested in some of the work that I've done um, recently some of the academic uh, work that I've, I've, I've put out um, the art in these caves and in other places too, but caves are a good example of this. They're a good example of of making us feel not at home in a very profound way, in a way that makes us think that actually, well, what's going on here is the very act of producing this this artwork is setting out what is ultimately of value to us as a as a human community who who live in a world that is not. Um, straightforwardly there for us it's not you know it is inhospitable you know we have to make the world our own we have to make places to live in we have to we have to do all of that um we have to create these worlds and art has a role to play in that art is the f is is um this is why Heidegger talks about you know bringing communities into being bringing communities into into history is that it's really the creation of the of the community itself in the production of the art, that's it creates the audiences, it creates the it creates the 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 way in which things can be encountered and become meaningful for us. Mm. So that's that's when we, you know going back to this idea, idea about composition is that what's going on here is that when we're composing works of art as a something like this, um, is that we're we're composing a a way of being in the world. We're composing a way of interpreting ourselves, interpreting the things around us. We're gathering these things together into particular um, particular points of view. I see you've switched. We're, we're uh, moving on. I have switched. We can go back. No, no, it's all right. It's good. I'm, I'm wondering about the response of the human, the construction of something that uh, self-fulfills. Um, so we make art to teach ourselves about ourselves. That we yeah, somehow, that's a good point. Yeah, that we somehow manhandle the world and bend it to our will through all of our creation, which actually is perhaps the antithesis of creation. If I'm to follow what you're suggesting, it's actually quite destructive that we bend things and mold yeah. things 
that already have sheep. And I do wonder a bit that when we look at things like the stones at Callanish, yeah, yeah. we spoke before, the, before we met this evening about how I might label each of these items uh, because I, I like to do things like this. I wanted to label every single slide and give exact dates and times. And you actually said, no, no, let's, let's just talk about like the, almost like the, the overall sense of, of work or, or artifacts or objects that belong to almost like an oeuvre of, of, of this. So this, this is not actually just about the stones at Kalanish. This is about megalithic yeah. monuments. And yeah. what, what is really the difference between a megalithic monument and a cave painting? Yeah. Well, this is a, this is a, yeah, this is a fascinating thing. Um, there was something I was going to say to you about Oh, was it? I was I had something I was going to say to you there a minute ago. Um, maybe it'll come back to me. Um, oh yes, that's what it was. Um, when you're talking about the uh, the fabrication of things mm. and how that, in a sense, is is um, is an important part of the story, you're absolutely right. One of the interpreters of Heidegger, um, Hubert Dreyfus, uh, put it this way: he said that what what these things are. Heidegger are what he calls what he what he describes as cultural paradigms. Mm. So you know, and I think that's a really a really you know because I started out as a in philosophy and and well, I had originally thought about archaeology as as, a, as my uh, subject that I'd study and moved into philosophy and then moved back toward archaeology and anthropology. But but anyway, the um, the the idea of a cultural paradigm really stuck with me because of its compositional nature. You know, it, it is what I just tried to describe in terms of the, the the setting, the setting up the kinds of narratives that that we can weave, uh, in our you know that weave us into them and that we then subsequently weave into our own lives. But the interesting thing for 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 Dreyfus is that on his reading of Heidegger there can be nihilistic cultural paradigms. There can be paradigms that overstate our ability to master the earth. Mm. So that what you get for Heidegger is this idea that, that in a work of art, there's an interplay. There's an interplay between, um, as he puts it, the world and the earth, or world and earth. And if you think of it this way, the earth is that which, which sort of resists us, which is... Um, not something that we can that we can master, and the world is this force of of um, of composition, and there's this there's this interplay between these two aspects in a work. So that the Calanish stones are really, or standing stones are, are a really good example of this because they're formed, but not completely. They're not polished, you know. And in, the, in these examples, anyway, um, there is a sense in which you get a, you get. Almost a almost a feeling of movement when you look at them, almost a feeling of instability despite their stability, right? So that when you look at this on this, this is a beautiful image, and you know you're getting the interplay of the stones and light here, which is again something that's that's been made a lot of, and I think is you know very very important. But again, this idea of a, a cultural composition mm. um, in this image. I feel as a, because after all, I'm a contemporary viewer. You know, I'm not speaking as an as a as a, a a builder of megaliths. And again, I think that's an important point: is that you know what we are doing now is is a contemporary thing. It's in the present, and we are looking at these images and narrativizing them, or telling stories about them. And some of these stories are more archaeologically based; some of them will be more philosophically based. But ultimately, the life of the work of art is still is still very much. Um, in being, it, the, the work of art is still doing something insofar as we're talking about it, you know, it's creating new meanings, this have interaction. We, have we become kind of cultural aggressors through our contemporary uh, prism? In, in that, you know, we, we're looking at a photograph on the screen now when we're studying uh, megalithic monuments, stones at Kalanish or whatever you want to call them. In fact, it doesn't even matter what we're looking at. The fact is, is that this work, this vital thing is not of now yet it is of us so are we passive in our looking at them are we engaged in our being with them or are we actually um cultural aggressors 
to to the memory of them. Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting point. That I think that one of the one of the things one, what we're, one of the things we're doing, if nothing else, is appropriating them in some way. Mm. Um, there's a form of appropriation going on. Um, I think that it can be more or less sympathetic. I think that what we, you know, um, and that can be partly to do with how we are, how we approach them. Mm. I think there's a real point about about the, the kind of touristic aspects of this. Yeah. I so just, that when we, you know, when we, um, when we take the stones down, you know. I was just going to say, so when we take something like the stones, and if we take the stones and remove them from their, their setting there, and if we put them in a museum or if we did something like that with them, I'm thinking, you know, maybe something like, um, you know, some of our, our artifacts that are in museums, but there's, a very, there's a very real act there that is, um, I don't want to say de facto destructive, but it's important. And what it's doing is it's, it's, it's changing. It's changing in a very important way. Um, I wonder about the desecration of art through our supposed appreciation of it. Um, yeah. Do you want to say a bit more about that? Well, this is really your, your time to tell me, but you're giving me so much to think about. And, you know, I, I know myself, I am a consumer. And I, I, we all are. I mean, you know, comfortable with that label, but nonetheless, I know it's the right label for for me. When I when I look at art, often I'm consuming it, and sometimes my intentions for the the consuming of art is actually not about uh, not about deeply appreciating. It's about something else. It's about yeah, and ownership and um, solace and something selfish. And, and but that is not a bad thing. I mean, that's that's you know we all do that. That's a very human way of and and this is the thing you know don't you know someone like um, the danger when you read someone like Heidegger or, or or something like that is that you're you know you're um, you can think that we all ought to be really quite priestly in our approach to art and that we all fall short of that because after all we all like to have nice pictures on our walls and you know and. It is not different and it is not radically different in kind to what we do when we're talking about these great works of art. I mean, the first thing I say for Heidegger is that he was uh, engaged in a really important distinction. He talked about great work of art, right? World forming art. So he's um, giving it a mantle that uh, that has that you know that is not um, the same as your pretty pictures on the wall or something like that. These are these are. These are, you know, these would not fit into the category of great work for, for someone like Heidegger. But Heidegger is forming the category, therefore... Yeah. Well, the, again, this is interesting, what he's trying to do, uh, and again, we don't have to stick to Heidegger, but this is just, a, you know, this is the thread that um, I kind of thought would be, uh, hold these images together. What he, well... Um, Philip, come on now, you're the thing that holds these images together. Ah well, yeah. You're Heidegger. What the hell does Heidegger have to do with any of this? What does Philip? <laughs> well, the idea um, is that, uh, yeah, the work, the 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 work, it's not so, the the work itself is producing the the context within which we approach it. Is the idea, so that it's not just a case of the the consumption of it you know um it's not a matter of looking at it and looking away in a in a in a, in, 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 in indifference there is a, a sense in which and again it's quite a conservative notion i think there's a sense in which we you know if we're taking this uh, heideggerian line that we ought to really behave in a particular way toward our art and that would involve involve um our uh, our activities around it are, you is know, holding of festivals and its presence, all these kind of things. Is that also assuming, though, that everybody who participates in the art at any stage or any point in it is behaving in the same way? What I mean by that is, does the artist behave the same towards the art as the viewer? 
does the person perhaps who is the subject of the art behave the same towards the art of them made in their image as the artist and then indeed the viewer. So behaviours around art, um, and forgive me because I'm such a, I don't know if Philistine's the right word. No, not at all, not at all. I'm, I'm not well versed in the You're way an artist. I am an artist. But I, you know, I, I can't recall or recount particular theories or um, what great minds have said about art. My interpretation of the world is quite immediately responsive and selfishly driven. <laughs> There's not a value even in that, a value judgment. I'm not saying whether that's a good or a bad thing. Mm. I think it's really, really interesting in approaching uh, being with these works that you've chosen for your desert island and um, that you've so carefully thought about how to view them through the prism of someone else <laughs> apart from you. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that, that's one of the things about this is that um, I, I chose these because they remind me of the kind of books I like to read. Mm. Which, when you think about it, is a very academic way of, <laughs> of approaching things. Um, you know, that's the thing. If I'm stuck on my desert island, mm. I'll probably have a lot of time to think. I mean, and I, I, I'm, I'm making this so basic for you. No, no, <laughs> but, not, but I, I love the idea. I think I said to you even in the email, I love the, I love the thought of like the, the, the stones being hauled up on the beach. And, and rearranged by you on your desert island. Yeah. Uh, well, I was lucky enough in Murmur Flats to, to look out over a, a, the, the kind of garden area of a primary school and they'd made their own stone circles. Mm. Um, so they had, you know, these megalithic monuments and I'm sitting in my flat trying to write about them and think about them and I can see that, you know, at lunchtime, see the kids running about them. And I think that's the point that, that I'd want to make is that, and it's the point we're talking about, about creating new meanings about things mm. is that you know when I look at these stones I don't just the academic uh, the academic kicks in right and I start thinking uh, you know what on earth did they do this for what on earth and it's not to say that everyone doesn't think this you know just that, that you know that, that I tend to to get that um very quickly I start thinking about theories and and um uh, you know anthropological theories and archaeological theories about things and and so on but equally, they remind me of a time in my life when I went on field trips mm. at uni. They remind me of a time in my life when I when I lived in that flat. Um, and I think that's part of the part of the thing here is that you know we can call that we can call that a kind of consumption, but actually it's and it, but it's not a bad kind of consumption. It's it's just a, an aspect of our engagement with the world. We we appropriate. I like the word appropriate. We appropriate the world. Yeah. Um, for good and ill. That's that's. That's what we do, you know, we, we create our own little kind of nest in the world, you know, if I can put it like that, our own place, for, our, our little world where we inhabit what and we make it familiar. The guardianship of this art then? See it again, sorry? What is the morality of our guardianship of this art then? That's a very good question. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, the argument could be made about steward, a form of stewardship yeah. um, for, for things that what we're doing is really... You know, if we're responsible, we're, we're, we're not being overly destructive of things, you know, where we can avoid it. Um, so I don't, think it's, I don't think it's wrong to go and see this stuff. I think, in fact, actually, it's a very good thing to go and see this kind of art, this public art, this, this and so on. But we, are, we should be mindful about our impact on it. And I think that probably the way I would, the way I would go would be to talk about a form of a form of stewardship, a form of cultural stewardship. Is that the same across all art and artefacts? Or does it change depending on what it is? That, again, that's a very good point. Um, we don't like, and I say we, right? I, I'm conscious of using that term, but generally speaking, most of us don't like to see works of art destroyed. Mm. Right? You know, we see that there's something actually quite significant going on there you know if you see the you know whether it was something like this temple here that you know if, if it was deliberately vandalized we'd, we'd it would sit uncomfortably with us well uh and yet we live in a, a time well actually as in any time in human history where there is active desecration 
and demolition of religious mm. schools. Yeah. Uh, so that when you talk about stewardship, is that particular only to educated uh, people from northern or western? I know. I, 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 I think that I think that there's a. I don't think the education thing matters on this. I think it's a it's a it's a it's a feeling. I mean, no, I, I you know, I, I, um, I am quite, I react quite emotionally to things like that. Um, and it, it would have nothing to do with. I mean, I remember being a, as a as a small child, I saw a couple of other boys um, hitting a crab with a brick on a or a stone on the beach, and I was absolutely appalled by it. I thought this was the most horrendous thing, and I, you know. Remember shouting at them, saying, "You know, don't." But why are you doing that? You know. So I think that it's, and that, that's you know I must have been about eight or nine. So it had nothing to do with an academic response, and it's the kind of thing that you know. And that's not to say that you know, as a teenager or, or or something like that, or as a younger person, I didn't do stupid things too. You know, um, I'm sure I could think of a few stupid things that I've done over the years that were in some way destructive. We go through these phases, but it's. It's something that perhaps that with our intellectual and emotional maturity that we start to see things and recognise that there is there is a value in these things. There is a value that in the, in the sense that someone has worked that I, that artifact. They have produced it. There's a there's a a care that has gone into it. So would you say that, uh, that preservation is an act of civility? That's a very good, yeah. That's a nice, that's a nice, that's a that's a good way of looking at it. But it's a kind of emotional civility, yeah. in a sense, a hosp a, a kind of um, hospitality to the work, if I can yeah. put it that way. So, so I, that we're, we're going to go backwards. I mean, we can go and see this. I think this is maybe in the Rijksmuseum. Where is this one? Where does this hang? I can't remember. But as a Van Gogh, yeah. person, you know, it will be well cared for. It will be treasured. Um, yeah. So we afford this an incredible luxury, an inanimate object afforded luxury. Is there an element of silliness in that? Um, <laughs> well, this is a, I think there's an element of humanness in it. Um, I think you know, this is I, an element, you know, we're looking at things, we're talking about not destroying them, not, not taking them for granted, making sure that we are guardians and that we take that guardianship very seriously. And, and maybe, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but there's an element of, of morality in guarding these things and preserving them. Mm -hmm. and, and yet when we, when we really do take something on, preserve it, as I said, in, in luxury, you know, this painting will live in kind of the, the palatial surroundings relative mm -hmm. to painting of all paintings. Yeah. And there is another way of looking at this, of course, is that to say that well, actually, what it is is that it's it's um, when it's been taken out of the context where it was supposed to be seen. Representational works like pairs of shoes and what have you are, are less obvious here, but when it's something like a stone um, sarcophagus or a, a piece of uh, you know a, a megalithic monument or some kind of more ritualized, mm. dare I say, ritualized piece of piece of art. Then there's a sense maybe what we're doing when we're putting them in a museum is we're we're taking works of art that no longer work, right? That are no longer holding open historical worlds for people. Does that mean that when we go to a, a museum? Yeah. Like you and I. That's right. So so the, the word museum, and again, this has been linked in the in the in the kind of theorizing about museums that the word museum and mausoleum are actually connected. Yeah. So you know, so what you're looking at here is you're looking at you know in museums. Have turned into a kind of dead artifact, yeah, an art, you know, so that and, and, or an, and and or an object of subjective representation, so that they're no longer they're no longer doing what what they ought to be doing, and which in this case here is, or indeed the Paleolithic art, and we showed the temple, they're 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 creating that historical outlook, that historical world. They're creating what it meant to be Greek. They're creating what it meant to be a hunter-gatherer or an early farmer, you know? And what that means is, let's say, say for example, the, the Paleolithic images. Mm. Um, what you don't, what these are, these are, you know, the argument here is that this is not a menu we're looking at, 
right? I mean, there, there had been the interpretation in the past that this is actually what we're looking at, is that we're looking at images that were involved in a form of sympathetic magic. So that you represent the image and you represent the killing of the image and then you go out and it comes true. Okay, you know, you go out and you, you, you kill the animal and you, you, you have a feast and, and all of that. But the archaeology doesn't bear that up because the archaeology points out that actually the vast majority of things that were being eaten here were reindeer. And, and in fact, there was a, this age had been called at one point the reindeer age because of the amount of reindeers that had been um, unearthed in the, in the middens, in the sites and so on. Um, but as you can see here, you know, you've got horses and oryx, right? You may actually have a, 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 you know, a stag of some kind there as well, but um, you're, not getting, um, you're not getting a menu. Something else is going on. And one of one of the arguments that ha, that has um, one of the arguments that's been made about this is that actually what you're seeing is you're 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 inside the womb of Mother Earth, and when you go and again this is suggested by some of the some of the entrances to the caves have got lots of red ochre on them. Mm. So the idea is that you know you're going into you're going into a, a, a womb, and the red ochre is symbolic of blood, but we don't know. I mean, this is the point. This is interpretation. You know. Um, again, other 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 aspects of the art of this time have been well, quite probably have been destroyed by accidental. Uh, you know what we are seeing here is the accident of the kind of thing that's preserved over this length of time. Is that the art that would have been outdoors has been has been destroyed and and, and that kind of thing. I mean, there, there still are places in Portugal where there's where there's outdoor art, but. It doesn't last in the way that, that this stuff lasts. So we can't, we shouldn't necessarily privilege something um, through the fact that it's been preserved in yeah. terms of you know, how significant it was. But, but nevertheless, I mean, I, again, the idea is that you know that the, I, I like the idea of, of of a sort of symbolic underscape, uh, you know, a, 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 an underscape to the to the to the landscape that you inhabit. You know, there's this there's this sort of symbolic um, underlying um, strata. Does that mean then for you that even artwork that we cannot see or directly experience anymore is nonetheless still valuable art, even though it's lost? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I think if you don't if you don't know about it, you don't know about it. Um, but I think if you know about it, um, I think like see for for example the the sociologist Only Lefebvre argued that the, the the point of this art was not to be seen necessarily, but simply to, to be known to be there. Yeah. Um, and when we think about our kind of moral, um, our moral, and again, I don't, sometimes some, part of me doesn't, doesn't always like using the word moral in these contexts. I think term, I, I prefer maybe the word like hospitality, but we're talking about, you know, the, mm. our, 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 our you know, civility and so on. I, I quite like the, the idea of, about that when you, just as you're hospitable to other peoples, mm. um, you can be hospitable to their works. Um, and part of that, you know, involves a certain, a certain, not necessarily reverence to them, but I kind of uh, an openness and and friendly willingness to to hear what they have to say. Um, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna take us back, just both of us, for a second to when we were children in Glasgow, mm -hmm. at Common Grove Art Gallery, and thinking about um, the thrill of peeking through the edge of the sarcoph uh, sarcophagus that was in yeah, there. Pabasa, the yeah. sarcophagus of Pabasa. Like having, to, having to really like get up close and then imagine that you could smell death. And you know, there was lots of magic involved in, in the kind of childhood participation of being with artifacts. Um, I'm just wondering about authenticity for a minute. It wouldn't have mattered two hoots to me as a child that that wasn't a real sarcophagus. As long as someone told me it was real and I could see it, I would believe it. Yeah. Do you think even as we go into adulthood, the same magic is true of art? I think it can be. I think it, I think it can be. Um, I mean, we could be looking at this image of Lascaux. This could be the facsimile. Yeah. Um, in the you know? in our consuming a, a, a photograph of the artifact about which we talk, Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that one of the, again, you know, one of the things that um, 
another theorist, uh, Walter Benjamin, um, he talked about the idea of the, the aura of the work of art. Um, and one of the things that um, was significant here is that you know you go to a particular place and that that has a, that, that that's part of its aura. Mm. You know, um, it can be reduced. And there's a, there is there is a, a an experiential side to that. I mean, whether 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 we would describe it as a sort of magic, um, I don't know. But I think that there's there's definitely an effect. I mean, you know what it's like when you see something that's that's really staggeringly you know effective. Um, I did. I, I nearly said beautiful there, but um, again, it's a word I'm sort of cautious of in in this why, context. Why are you cautious of the word beauty? Um, because it is a word that's got a lot of history in the interpretation of of art, and I think that we, we it, it could it could lend us it could it could push us down the more subjectivist interpretation. I was trying to get at this idea that um, that the effect that it has on you is not just about our sort of su subjective apprehension. There's a there's a um, there's a, 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 a again this kind of compositional aspect to things that you're you're hit by something, um, and it involves you in this this interplay of of meanings, um, where you have to where you have to really get a sense of re-territorializing yourself in in the moment, so that there are you know. Um, You are, in, in a sense, um, forced to relearn how to see things in a way, forced to, to relearn how to look at things when you really see something that powerful. You know, um, so like when I, you know, the first time I saw, and again, this is one of the reasons why I've chosen these works is that, you know, when I first approached something like this, um, I was an irrev irreverent. Uh, undergraduate, right? You know, so um, you know, I remember you know putting my cigarette out before I went up to the up close to them and and all this kind of stuff. So I wasn't exactly, you know, I wasn't exactly involved in a self consciously spiritual experience, but it had a real effect, you know. Um, and it's the kind of it's the it's the it, it, and well, I mean, it's again, you know, the, 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 the you start thinking that it's the sort of what on earth moment that what on earth were they thinking what you know but it has a it does have a, a powerful effect on you and you have to start thinking about how you you know how you are going to how you are going to interpret them you know but does this though mean that the exclusive rights to feeling about art and artifact is when in their presence um Again, an interesting question. Do you mean like sort of that, you know you can't have that feeling afterwards, or you can't have it in in a you know at home later thinking about it, or? Well, I'm thinking I'm thinking about um you know someone like me as an art student living in Glasgow, uh, or even just being in the UK and knowing that there's lots of work that I love that might be in America, for example, and having never um been present with the original artwork. Yet having a very strong sense that I uh, respond, my response is one of real intensity to what, yeah. whatever I see. Um, but then visiting later and actually seeing the original, there perhaps being a, a different sense of it again in its in its actual form. Yeah, uh, comes back to this idea about facsimile. Or, or truth, really, I suppose, truth about objects and, and what they mean in their natural state, in their um, consumable form, in their representation, the photograph of a photograph, so to speak. Um, looking at the stones at Callanish, I'm thinking about going to, uh, like we went on a school trip to the Ring of Brodgar in Orkney, mm -hmm. And um, this like, was when you were a, a, a pupil. Yeah, uh, like you stopping before I went up, stomping on the cigarette. <laughs> yeah. And and just kind of bouncing about in the heather, feeling something joyous being there, but not necessarily 
having a reverence, really. Whereas then looking back through photographs of the place, understanding, understanding the specialness. Mm, and that flips things on its head a little. Um, that sometimes we can consume art and artifact only when it is presented to us in a flatter form. Mm. That somehow yeah. in, its, in its actual space, it's almost overwhelming that it becomes part of the landscape and so are we. Therefore, we no longer notice it and that reverence is lost. Uh, do you know, that's a point that I was trying to make earlier about this, you know, being part of the landscape yourself and perhaps missing certain things. Mm. And then on, in our quieter moments, when we, we get a sense of that, we get a sense of that immersion in things, you know. Um, yeah, I think, that, I, think that's, I, think that, I think that's a really important point there, is that, you know, when, you know, um, When we do look at things afterwards, when we look at things um, in images, they're suffused with memory. Yeah. Well, this is what and you're saying. I, I know you're you're taking me to it in baby steps. This idea that the your your portfolio of things for your desert island is really about memory. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it is. It's about it's about the experience of having having um, each one of these um, works you know as a when i look at them it, it, it's reminding me of learning it learning to look at art learning to to try and appreciate art learning to try and uh, understand architecture um trying to understand what it means to be human and what it means to create and compose so in a sense it's more valuable that the, the memory of that experience of working with this these works and working with you know philosophy of art um, in a sense, is more the, the memory of that is more valuable than um, a, a particular image of, of one of them, if you know what I mean. Um, you know, in a sense, it could be any image that I'm looking at. Is it's what 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 it's doing is it's, it's reminding me of something. You know, you you said to me <laughs> in the sweeping strokes, Greek temple and Gothic <sighs> architecture. Mm, are they actually the same thing? How do you mean? In, in terms of well, they, they are they are they are all the same thing in the, insofar as this interpretation goes of of um, creating historical worlds. Mm. The kind of worlds they create are different, um, but that you know the, their their function is to you know hold open a space of interpretation um, that enables the medieval individual to be the medieval individual, right? Um, you know you you you're getting a sense of your outlook on yourself through the work. Now, medieval cathedrals are a good example of this because they're absolutely, um, I mean, you know, you look at this thing and it's, a, it's, it's an absolutely remarkable. Every, almost every piece of stone there has some kind of contextual meaning, whether it's actually bearing a particular image, you know, from the rose window, you know, the most beautiful of flowers, right? Um, uh, uh, right through to the to the gargoyle, to the um, to the you know the stations of the cross, all of these things. There's a there's an entire, if you like, there's a, a summary of a summary of theology in stone. And the the building has a very performative effect on people. I mean, the, one of the first things you do when you go into a Gothic cathedral through the portals and the doors, you go in um, through a cathedral. You know, you look up. Uh, I think to a, to a, to an individual, that's probably what we do when we go into something like this. If I've never been in one before, it's the you know the first thing you do is you is you look up, mm. and that that's no accident. That's entirely entirely deliberate. You know, it's a it's a material metaphor of the soul being drawn heavenward toward the divine. Um, I, I would suggest this is one way of looking at it. And what you're getting here as you go through the the the, the interpretive meanings of all of the the carvings and, and, and all of that, you're getting you're getting a sense of what it means to be a a, a Christian, a Christian person at this time. You know, um, this outlook. Do you think um, this really fascinates me because I'm not a Christian person. Uh, sure. I wonder when people enter spaces like this now, you know, we're talking about something that 
at the time of this particular building's erection, there would have been a a, a sense of of religiosity or yeah um, being faithful. Exactly that. I think that's that's the crucial thing. Being faithful. It's something that was was done. It was something that was performed in a, in a human life. But um, if each if each stone carving has its own narrative, its own language of um, obedience to Christianity, for example, and we now view it through the the prism of our contemporary world, and the meaning therefore becomes um, what could it be either expanded or contracted because of our current cultural paradigm? Uh, is this still a, a is this still a holy building? Is this still a, a I know it's still a place of worship. Yeah, yeah. Have the same command now, do you think, as it would have done 300, 400 years ago? That's, you know, again, a really interesting uh, question. One of the good things about this is the, the, the kind of religious outlook that this building serves is still around. I mean, it's different, of course, to the medieval experience, but there is still a, a, there are still Christians, you know, and there are still Christians who worship in the place and who go to it and, you know, in, in forms of pilgrimage and, and, and all of that. Um, and then there are other people who go to it as a historical artifact. Um, and there are even others who will go to it as a beautiful artifact. And what, if you could step outside of all of that and watch, if you, if you had the, if you could, you know, get outside of that and sort of, you know, look in on, on human life, um, and not, you know, not be directly participating in it, you may get a sense by watching um, the faithful. Uh, you may get a sense of the kind of work that the building's doing for them, the kind of emotions that it's bringing to the fore, the kinds of um, fear and trembling, if I can put it that way, that they experience when they go in, and when when they're in the presence of it. And then you'll get the other person, you know, uh, walking up to it and putting their flag out before they go in. <laughs> Forgive me, you boss. Know, um, and it's, <laughs> it's it, you know. That this is really, uh, this is really testing me, speaking about this, because. Uh, it's testing me as well, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's been a while. I'm just thinking, though, in terms of what you're saying, you know, the, the religious person arrives and they feel, they feel the presence of the, the divine. Um, and still people congregate and gather here to worship. But I wonder those who gather here and congregate to worship in the Christian context, I wonder if they do so because of the nature of the narrative of the building or whether they do that because the building has commanded a memory that once there was worship happening. That, was excellent. Happening. That's a really good point. I mean, you know, this is a lovely thing that brings us back to Heidegger because there was a, there's a story about Heidegger. Um, What's that? Hi Heidegger, wherever you Hi are. Hi Heidegger, exactly. Um, <laughs> talking, about, talking about Hi Heidegger. I remember once I was, I was doing my PhD, right, and I was watching, uh, I was watching some daytime TV, as you do, and um, I was clicking channels, and I put on... Um, PhD. What's that? Especially when you're doing a PhD. Yeah, so anyway, I put on, and it was Sherlock Holmes, and Sherlock Holmes is running about um, the, the countryside trying to catch the baddie and the baddie's name is Heidegger. And it was this really surreal moment, you know, thinking, uh, you know, seeing this as a, sitting there, I'm sitting there with a copy of Being in Time in front of me thinking, what, 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 what on earth, you know, um, I'm being watched. But the, the thing that brings me back to Heidegger is that Heidegger, you know, famously, if I can put it that way, left the, left the Catholic Church um, and you know, was supposed to be you know, an atheist, or, or, or as interpreted that way anyway, um, by, by some people, and um, other others would interpret him as a as a a more sort of um, Protestant Christian. But anyway, he was out walking with a friend, and um, he, I think it was either he crossed himself or genuflected or, or did something when he passed the the. The, the, the entrance to a church or you know crossed himself or, or something along those lines and his friend kind of said well what are you doing I thought you were I thought you were into all that kind of stuff and he said well well actually where there has been so much praying the holy is present in a in a in a in a, in a special kind of way and that's what we're that's what I'm 
partly what I'm interested in here in, in some of these, these artifacts yeah. is that that's the experience you're, you're tapping into. You're, you're tapping into a profound, whether, whether we call it the emotions or, or we, well, I think the emotions are a good, a good way to draw it together. We're, we're tapping into a profound emotional experience when we're in, in, at these places. Um, they, they have an effect on us. Uh, you know, I think it would be very hard to be in that position, looking at those stones and seeing the light in that way, and not be profoundly affected by it in some form. Mm. Um, I mean, in my in my in my worst teenage self, I might have went, "Oh yeah, that's nice," and wandered off. But you know, <laughs> either side of either side, I, yeah, no, either 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 side of those years, um, you know, I would have had <laughs> I would have been affected. But but you know, it's the it's. It, there is a there is a, a participatory experience in something meaningful um, when we experience these things, and part of that I think is the if you like you know it's the ghosts of the people who were there. Yeah. You know we're, we're getting a sense that there has there has been something here. There has been a there has been a powerful a powerful experience, um, and. It's, there's a there's a feeling in us that's being awakened. I'm not saying there are metaphysical ghosts or anything like that, you know. But what I'm what I'm saying is that as 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 beings that are sensitive to the world and sensitive to to, to meaning, um, we are. It's being provoked in us. There's a there's a correspondence between the, the you know the, the artwork and ourselves. There's a corresponding going on. Um, are you leading me to think that art is experience? Well, you could put it that way. I mean, um, that, I'm being really simplistic now. No, no, no. There's nothing simplistic about that. I mean, it's the, you know, it's the idea that you know, but it's it's what kind of experience are we talking about? Well, I'm sure John Dewey wrote about this or spoke about this. It was something to do with the Kappa Delta Pi lectures that he did. You know, a book called Art as Experience, yeah. The the. That's right. Um, I don't know what we can. Do. The art is experience, but also art. Mm-hmm. Art is is human presence. So we feel whether yeah, I just had some John Dewey. Yeah. Um, Thank you for proving your uh, jobs to me. That's, <laughs> That's my credentials. Um, so if art is experience and we're experiencing art, then we as humans look for just other human presence and that in any human presence through the tunnel of time, we may feel some deep connection or communality. Yeah, a, few, a fusion, a fusion of, our, of horizons, a fusion of the way I see things and the way that it, potentially someone saw things in the past as concretized in the work. I'm not saying we, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're opening prehistoric minds and looking inside or anything like that. Nothing, nothing of the of the kind. But what we're looking at is a is a past way in which the world was opened up, a past way in which the world was made meaningful. But also, um, okay. the prehistoric mind not still our mind you know we have a prehistoric mind within our mind yeah 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 no i mean that that's a that's a that's a uh an important thing but what i was meaning was um we're not getting we're not opening up their mind and seeing exactly what they thought do you see what i mean i'm not saying that you know we can look at these works of art whatever the works of art are and know the minds of the people that created them I don't think we can do that. Less than you know, I don't think time does time necessarily have anything to do with this. Actually, I think I, I am in a, in, a, in, a, in a. This is a, again, this is a really important point. Is that um, I wouldn't get too hung up on how far away and, and how remote things were in time. Mm. Is that what we're doing? You know, I think yes, it matters, and chronology matters, and, and uh, you know, and from the point of view of constructing scholarly narratives, absolutely it matters, and, and all of that. But from the point of view of of, of um, you know, if I didn't know when these people abandoned this site or when they died out or when or whatever site it was, when the people, you know, left or in a sense, that doesn't really matter. What matters is that you're you're engaged in an experience and this is where the experience is born, and in a sense, an experience of experience. Mm. Human if if you if human experience is a kind of appropriation of things, a kind of making meaningful an emotional um feel of, of the way in which things are that is profoundly affecting, then art work is doing that, is showing us how that occurs. 
you know, and some some more modern art is a great way of looking at that when you're looking at um, something like Jackson Pollock, maybe, or something, uh, you know, you know, where what you're looking at is you're looking at, if you like, you're looking at the moment of, of, you're looking at the moment before the representation becomes the representation. You know, one way I like to think about it is that there you, you're look, you know, this is inviting you to see the world as if it is being composed there and then for you. You know, someone may say, well, what's the value of a piece of modern art? Well, it could very well be partly that. It's that what you're doing is you're, you're seeing the, the process of, of, of composition there and then. You know, it's inviting you to experience, it's inviting you and then to think, you know, about precisely the way in which things are composed. And that brings us back to this idea about composition as, as an important aspect of, of, of all of this. Is that you know if there are two things that we're doing, we're experiencing um, in a deep emotional way, and we're composing through a form of appropriation, through a form of setting up of a of a of a meaningful outlook on things, and that meaningful outlook is it, 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 you know can be again to use the word that I was a bit nervous of earlier, it can, it can be beautiful, you know, it can be seen to be beautiful, you know. You know, beauty in a sense is a is a is a really important concept here. We haven't really talked about it, and you know, could partly because I've been I've been nervous of the of the term. But you know, it, what we what we talk about is beauty here is is you know, it's not just a subjective thing. There's a there's a there's an emotional and also an intellectual component to it. It's so funny and so incredibly interesting talking to you about this because I use beauty. I talk about beauty. Um, you know, worship at the cult of beauty, I, I, you know, every day of my life. And uh, I don't usually think of beauty as having components. I don't see beauty as separate from anything. And so to hear somebody breaking it away because of a nervousness of it being too subjective it's, it's like listening to a totally different language for me. Well, that's, uh, maybe that's a good thing. That's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's why it's interesting that we, you know, we're trying to fuse our horizons here on this. You know, it's, it's, it's a nice way of um, you know, coming at things. I mean, like, there's nothing wrong with using the term beautiful. Um, you know, absolutely not. You know, I, I think that for me, what, I'd, what I would always want to do in, in this context, you know, we're talking about stones, we're talking about standing stones or, or uh, cave paintings. What do we mean when we use the word beautiful about them? You know, I, and I would want to, you know, in a sense, kind of like leave that as a question, mm. as something maybe to come back to, um, or to think about going forward. You know, it's like, well, what, what do we mean when we, when, what kind of vocabulary do, do we use about art and what does it mean? You know? Have you just signed yourself up to do another one of these with me? <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, I guess so. Um. Philip, thank you. I, I feel like my I feel like my brain is like I don't know what's happened to, to my brain when you've been talking. It's really lovely. You've frozen at Zoom for us. My connection probably. No, it's really lovely. I'm saying it's really lovely listening to somebody Sorry, you could, you could. who's so knowledgeable. You're so knowledgeable about things that I can't even approach. I don't know about that. I think that um, you know. I think that what I really enjoyed about that, Sandy, was the the fact that you were you're making a lot of the points I'm trying to articulate. You know, um, through having uh, read a couple of books um, about you know about these things from that you were making the points, you know, and I was responding and adding in some interpretation. So that was that was a lot of fun. So, viewers, meet us here another time to try and dig deep with Dr. Dr. Philip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, next time we'll do pop art. We'll do something like that. To make it easier for me. <laughs> no, for me. I was, I, was, I was looking at some of that stuff today, actually. Um, some Warhol, and it was uh, you know, nice to see. And different to the stuff I usually look at, so.
Well, Philip, thank you so much for spending the time with me. And oh, my pleasure. Thank you for thank you so much for inviting me. It's a uh, it's uh, you know a real treat and a, a real privilege to be asked. So thank you. Okay. Thank you.